Welcome to the One Stiletto in the Grave podcast with your hosts, Sonny Ormond and Jane Jane. Well, Happy New Year, you lovely listeners. We're back and we have a stellar guest on our show today. Was that a clue? Well, think dragons, castles, cafeteria cheese and corgis. Think Barry Island. <laughs> have you guessed it yet? Well, all will be revealed. So kick off your shoes, snuggle down on your bing bags and be delighted by this tidy Celtic queen. That Janie and I are thrilled to be joined today by an award-winning national treasure. An actress, comedian, writer, producer, novelist, avid Archers listener. Oh, yes, and probably a little known fact, a one-time member of the Girls Nautical Corps. It's <laughs> Ruth Jones. <Yay! laughs> hello, hello. Hello, welcome, welcome, well- Ruth. We oh. will want to know more, much more about <laughs> Girls Nautical Corps later. But first of all, um, we know that you're an Archers fan. How long have you been listening? Oh, gosh. I think I started listening. When I was at university, so that's mid-80s, I did a radio drama module. And that's when I started listening to Radio 4 drama, really. And then I, I think it was around that time. So that would have been... Yeah, sort of mid eighties, but I think properly I started in about nineteen ninety one. I started listening, so yeah, I've list, been listening for how many years is that? I'm terrible at maths. Thirty something years, is it? Some years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a long time. Yes. yes. So, so, I, uh, what keeps you listening now? I mean, what is it about the program oh, that you enjoy so much? Don't start me off because I'm <laughs> literally, I, I've got. Sometimes I get really cross with it. I'm not going to lie. I get really cross. Like I go, why did you start us off on that story? And then we never found out what happened. Why did you get rid of Jennifer so brutally? Why, you know, why, why don't we know who's moved into the Aldridge's home? I mean, and why would Brian act, and Brian and Jennifer sell the house just because Kate was having a tantrum? That sort of thing. So um, I do get really obsessed with it, but I just love it. It's like my comfort place. I love, um, and, and people say to me, um, oh, would you like to be in the arch? I say, oh, good God, no. That would spoil it. Because for me, Ambridge really, really exists. And although I know what a radio studio looks like, the thought of being, I mean, I, honestly, when I listen to it, I visualise the whole mm. village, the whole place. So I couldn't, it would ruin it for me to be in it. <laughs> it's it's so interesting you say that because obviously being in it, um, I still can listen to it because I tend to try and listen if I can to the omnibus always. And I, right. I can lose myself in it, even though I'm in it. And I know what that studio looked like, you know, and I know whether I still, it's the power of the imagination somehow that allows me, even though yes. I know what it actually looks like physically to immerse myself in this imaginary world it's fascinating actually yeah it is you know? and i think that's the power of radio isn't it i mean yeah. radio yeah. is so uh, the the way that it can transport you you can go absolutely anywhere in the universe in radio mm. and um and and i just do i do find that that connection really really powerful and and lillian i have to say that you are really i would say it definitely my top three favorite characters. I just oh. called you Lillian. There we are. You see, I called you Lillian and not Sunny. So that just all shows right. It's all right, how... darling. I'm, I'm but... used to it. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just think she's an absolute breath of fresh air. And I loved it when you see. You shouldn't start me off on the arches. I loved it when. Um, I loved those those the bubbles the 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 not the bubbles the ar- arches. What was it called? The arches. The sort of spin offs that they did oh, years yes, ago. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, on on Radio Four Extra. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. 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 Oh, and, they, and and Lillian went to no, she didn't go to Russia. Did, did, didn't she? Didn't Matt yes, go to Russia or something? Went to Russia. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. And, and it was terribly um, dramatic. And, and, and yeah. Oh, hugely dramatic. Hmm. And the only thing about I did listen to them, but I didn't like going inside their heads. And, and mm. of the I, and I didn't like um, you know because I and the, and I know during COVID that. Obviously, there were co- huge constraints on recording, um, mm. and uh, that was the only time I didn't really listen because I didn't, I couldn't bear being inside the head of any of the characters. Mm. I felt intrusive somehow and rude. Mm. 
So mm. they didn't want to work there. No, it's it's interesting because I think they did that to try the idea initially was to try and win over a younger audience, is my understanding of it. Because initially I think it was a lot of the very younger uh, characters within the show and then it developed into other stories as well. But no, it was interesting yeah. that and I do remember a debate at the time about those inner monologues and whether they should be used or not. So it's interesting really what you're saying. But no, it was such good fun and I think I think it was financial reasons basically why it was sort of yeah. pulled in the end um yeah but we had a fabulous time and in fact there was a big outcry because matt and lillian split up but on radio 4 extra not in the main arches and a lot of people weren't listening to that i don't oh. know if there's a terrible hoo-ha about all that and, and my lips are sealed about I, it but mm. <laughs> <laughs> also now this this there's something that happened in one of those episodes which is that jazza spent the night with Fallon. They had a night of passion in in a van and that was never alluded to. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think that things like that, I I I mean I love that about the artists. And I love the way that they can start a story, you know, something can happen years ago. And and it unlike with television soaps, because I don't watch any television soaps, The Archers is the only soap that I know and love. Mm. Um, and I it, they would start something like, say, for example, when John's son appeared out of, oh. you know, and that story that came yeah. back to life from years ago. Mm. Um, I just thought that was really clever. And I think that's what what the archers does really well is it it sort of um nurtures stories and lets them kind of bubble away and then they come to the surface and, that, and that's what i really think it's at its best yeah. that's right seeds I are sown they are i mean the classic mm. one i suppose is robin helen isn't it because that unfolded kind of in yes. real time and we were all not sure for a while mm. yes yeah, I yeah. mean, that was, I, I remember going into, I had to go to Radio 4 for something during that time. And I was going, and it was just before they had the the, the um, verdict. And I was going, I, I, I was in the radio drama department and um, there were a couple, there was a producer there and uh, uh, somebody else who worked there. And I was going, I'm serious. You cannot, you cannot let her be found guilty. I, I, I said, I <laughs> said, Oh, that's right. I, said, I won't. I'll stop listening. I will stop listening. As if that's going to make any difference. Stop listening if she's found guilty. And I said, and and also the other time I did it was when, when David Archer. I actually wrote to Tim Bentink, and I just said, if their farm gets sold, do you remember when they, when it was going the road yeah. was going to go through yeah. and all that? Yeah. If the yeah. farm gets sold, I am going to stop listening. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Oh, oh no! We better not. Miss Jones is going to stop listening. But that's what? how much I love it. That's how much I love it. I know. <laughs> I, I know. Would you like to write for it, Ruth? Oh, <laughs> sometimes I would. But then again, it's similar sort of thing to being in it in a way because, again, I just feel that they're real people, and I'd be, mm. yeah, yeah, I don't know. It would sort of spoil it for me. I think. <laughs> yeah. So. Who do you think is Lillian's true love? Do you think it's Matt or do you think it's Justin? Well, what about, what's his name? The brother. Oh, Paul. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Paul. Paul, mm. was it Paul? Yeah, was it she Paul? Was, she, yeah. It was Paul. She, yeah, that was mm. really, that was really lovely, that, that, yeah. that relationship, very, wasn't very it? very full on. And it was interesting yeah. for me as an actor because when they decided to create that storyline, I thought, oh, God, this is really interesting because actually she she was devoted to Matt. But, of course, you know, he really didn't give her the love that she wanted. Um, in my mind, when Paul came along, the reason that she did it was because he looked terribly like Matt. And so it was the uh, other side yeah. of the coin. You know, as an actor, yeah. you, you try and find what is driving you? What's my motive? Because I want to make this truthful. And I thought, that's what it is. He is providing her with all the things that Matt can't give her. But she really, it's Matt that she really loved. But So it was yeah. interesting for me yeah. to to find a way through I it. Because sometimes you're given storylines, aren't you, and things. And you think, oh, hang on a minute. Am I, am I going to make this work, you know? And and it's just, yes. um, but anyway, yeah. yeah. But yeah, Paul, I, he, adored, he adored him. Paul. <laughs> Um, and 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 um, I, but I just thought the whole Matt and Lillian as a combination were really exciting and interesting mm. as a couple mm. as well. Mm. You know mm. the whole pussy cat thing and yeah, uh, yeah I, I loved it when he came. I loved it when he appeared. 
Um, then there've been some great, there've been some really great characters. I actually mm. wrote to the Archers the other day because I said, look, to the, the production office, I said, I'm sorry, why is Bert suddenly reappeared when he's dead? And you're oh. talking about Bert in the pub. And of course they were talking about Bert Horribin. Horribin, yeah. But Bert Horribin's mm. never been called Bert Horribin. He's always called Dad or mm. Grand Grandpa. Mm. He's never... Mm. <laughs> so, uh, no, there are oh, well some great... I love it as well. Yeah. 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 There, there's there's always been a sort of rule that you can't have two people with the same first name in Ambridge, haven't there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> precisely, well, because of, precisely because of that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, well, and yet in real life, of course, you have loads of people with the same name. We in Stella, when we did this um, series for Sky, we had mm -hmm. we had Di Davis. We, so we made oh. a thing of it. There were two characters called Di, Di which I mean, you yeah. get millions of Dies in Wales, mm -hmm. and so we had a whole thing: Di, Di Davis or Di, or Di, Di Cotton. Cotton. <laughs> we yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Which, um, you know, moving. On. Just adore it. I mean, adore your all your work anyway. But st funny enough, I've been watching a uh, load of Stellas today. They're such oh. clever characters, Ruth. Yeah. I just, it's this. The, even the smallest characters are just so beautifully formed. I was just saying to Janie, like the girl who's in the hotel, who's the waitress, and it's oh, oh, oh. yes. I mean, you yes. just the tiniest. <laughs> You know, just so oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Thank but with, with that, me. though, I'm just fascinated. I mean, how much time is spent? Is it the way you're casting or how much time is spent directing people? Or where do those fabulous, the writing, of course, is it all there in the writing before you begin? I, well, it's funny because you met that character. It was actually based on a real waitress when i was um a student when i'd come home in the holidays i i waitressed in a local hotel and i used to have to sort of follow the main waitress and she would go around and she used to say she she would do silver service mm -hmm. and i would be there with the gravy behind her she'd do silver service and she'd go carrots please <laughs> potatoes please <laughs> And that's no, that's where it came from. A direct, a direct okay. lift from there. Um, Brilliant. And and some, I mean, some, but but then some actors brilliantly make things their own. So um, mm. we had a, a nursing instructor in the in series three uh, called Cheryl, and she was just like she just she naturally had a really lovely Ron the Valley's accent, and she just made it made more of what we'd written you know so sometimes it's it's a combination of both really um but a lot of it is 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 observation i suppose and and just i like i like to have i, I i'm a bit of um it's not pollyanna but i just i think there's so much awfulness in the world mm -hmm. that i like to write worlds that are where people like each other yes <laughs> and this you know what i mean and there's a bit more yes. positive going on um so yeah so i think a lot of it comes from that i like daftness daft daft oh, yes uh, there's yes. so much i'm stella's just I brilliant please I please know. please tell me that paula is based on a real person because then i just kind of want to <laughs> she's brilliant oh i just i just, just love her those scenes oh, they are the, the alcoholic undertaker yeah, yeah. i know breathalyzing yeah. stuff before she takes the house out it's <laughs> just <laughs> genius Ruth. it is genius. it is genius she's so funny, funny. With with um with that character, because obviously she appears in the very first episode of Stella, mm. and um when I wrote that, because we, we'd had a kind of an idea of of I, I think yeah, so me and my husband want, knew we we kind of created the the the, the, the we had the concept for it, but mm -hmm. I sort of wrote that first episode, and and I just didn't really know what it was going to be. All I knew was that she was a single mum who had a son by somebody when she was uh, 16. He then, the father of the, of the son, went off to Canada and then she went on to marry and have um, uh, two more kids. <laughs> and that's all I knew. And so when it came to bringing, I knew she would need a confidant and a best friend. And and um, I thought, oh, it'd be good if she was an undertaker. <laughs> and uh, at that point, I didn't know if she was going to be an alcoholic, a functioning alcoholic. <laughs> um, uh, so I thought, oh, well, I'll have her call round to a customer who's, uh, you know, to talk about funeral arrangements. So she knocks on this guy's door and uh, he answers it and she says, oh, I've come to, um, I've, it's about your mother. I've come to measure her up. 
and uh, she he goes, oh yes, you better come in. And she's like uh, sitting there going, and, and so where is she? she uh, oh, upstairs. And so they have this whole conversation and they discuss what the coffin is going to be like and what sort of lining do you want? Silk or um, satin or leather and they go oh my god and then they go into this huge snog and they start snogging and then they go upstairs and i thought oh i really like that idea that she would just get off with a customer a grieving customer and then i thought oh i know i'll take it a step further and maybe they could actually be married and this is like a sex game that they do oh and then oh i know i'll make him he could be Stella's brother so it sort of like goes so, so i had no plan it just all kind of happened sort of organically really. organically <laughs> organically and it's just so yeah. funny yeah. that yeah that you know Stella sort of every now and then she comes around and they're in the middle of some I know. horrendous sex game I know. and she's I know. sort of presented with a view of her of her brother's bum and yes. it's just yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yes, and, yeah. yes, and Big Al witnesses it. I remember one time through a letterbox. I don't think he was ever the same since. You know, no. it's wo- no. you know, one wonderful, and and of course, Daddy, who <laughs> who everybody else oh, understands. God, I love Daddy. We understand not a word of him. I mean, it's such a well, clever again, concept. He was that. based. He was based on a neighbour. Um, oh, from where we used to live years ago, and. Um, we could never understand a word he said he, because he mumbled. So he'd he'd go, "Oh, um, hello, John. Yeah, how are you today?" And, well, so no, it's <laughs> right. And literally couldn't understand what he said. So I, what we wanted to do with Daddy was have it that everybody else understood what he was saying, but the audience wouldn't know. And it's my clever. father got used to get really annoyed with it. Why don't they, Why don't they put it on the subtitles? I can't understand the word he's saying to get really really cross um and and ha- it was played by the wonderful howell evans who's yeah. no longer with us Aww. and he did it so brilliantly yeah. um and and he had such a great through line in the series because he he died in series two and had the funeral and we had this whole process where paula was the grieving daughter and she asked for all these items to be put in the coffin according to what daddy had wanted and they do the checklist and pennies two pennies for his eyes and and a candle and uh, and and a mobile phone and all these kind of things that he wanted in there and then you know in the middle of the service this phone starts ringing and Paula gets really cross because who who phone is it and she looks at her own mobile phone and it says daddy and it's like oh my god um, and so, and then we 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 then did actually have him. He, he did actually then die in a later uh, series. And because Howell had never really had the chance to speak coherently as <laughs> as as the character of Daddy, we decided to give him a twin brother. So the twin brother came to Daddy's funeral, and he was able to give a eulogy, which was lovely to hear Howell actually speak the first time but he quoted daddy and quoted him in daddy speak oh, and everybody in the congregation started laughing like oh yes that's really funny <laughs> the viewing audience wouldn't have a clue what he was saying so uh yeah it was, it was really good fun it was really oh, good. there's think, just some uh, the other funeral the other funeral i remember is i think it's in the first series where i can't even think he's funeral it is and neil kinnock delivers the eulogy really and he was yeah. so funny it was so funny yeah yeah that was um we, we had a fictitious um rugby player oh, called dick the kick that's it and, um and we managed to get loads of the the welsh rugby team came mike phillips was there and shane williams and and we even had warren gatlin the coach he's he there's a close-up of him i mean the, it, it was it was amazing really that we had had all these people and yeah neil kinnock who um just was so funny he he was he was really really got great comic comic timing actually yes it was it, <laughs> oh. was it was superb so how much and i suppose maybe this applies to gavin and stacy as well i mean i know with victoria wood a script was written and it was sacrosanct and you couldn't change anything how do you feel that with your scripts what, what is your attitude with that um i suppose with gavin and stacy we were quite strict about uh, changing anything because because James and I both actors and we would read the script in character so we would once we'd got them finished we would then go back over them and really 
become quite detailed about the the de- the delivery and 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 what the actual lines were. And to be fair, the actors were really respectful of that, and they didn't. I can't really remember them wanting to change anything. I mean, maybe here and there they they would, but um, and of course, again with with that, the the actors brought so much to it. I mean, Alison Steadman just is genius the way she can just bring a character to life you know we had we did have her in mind when we were writing it and I suppose that that helped but we didn't know what exactly she was she was going to do with it and then characters like say Dave Coaches he was only ever meant to be in one episode oh was he yeah but Stefan Rodri who played him just so brilliant and uh he did that kind of that real sort of dry Cardiff like uh Fags and weed, glue and speed, but I jars the line at crack. And just, he was so good the way he delivered it. We just thought, oh, we've got to see more of him. And he ended up being a really major part in the in the whole series, you know. So um, it's a it's a lovely process when you see what actors actors bring to it. But they very to 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 go back to what you were asking, Sunny. They they people generally are very. Um, Unless and I mean, we would always be open to to changing things if we felt it didn't work. But I think we'd worked so closely on the script that we felt it was up to speed. Um, you know, other pe- I, I've worked with Steve Coogan, and he's often very up for improvisation, or Julia Davis was up for improvisation. And I suppose it just depends on 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 how you like to work, really. And I think it's interesting because both you and James are actors, and that was the way that you would look at your scripts and you would read them out loud because actors have a natural kind of rhythm you, you you know you know what your character's rhythm is going to be so hopefully then by the time you pass the script on to the actors you've already played around with that rhythm you've got it you've secured it really which is the yes, difference I think yeah. when actors write um possibly you know um one's got to be a bit careful what one says but you, you know sometimes with scripts things are not sayable you know, you well, know what I mean in certain scripts. I don't mean, you know, uh, everyone's got to be careful. Yeah, so. no, I know. That's a really good point. And, and, and the one one thing I always think is quite interesting, and I and I find this when I'm right. So I, I think I can write good dialogue, but my plots are not always as good. I think my dialogue's better than my plots. But anyway, I think um, one thing, I, I often say this to people when they're just sort of, you know, if they're asking about writing, I say, one thing that really bugs me is when people put somebody's name in when they're talking to them in their sentence. Because the thing is, Jane, mm-hmm. if I use your name or yep. if I use your name, Sonny, it sounds like almost like a little bit punitive or you're, you're telling somebody off. It, yeah. it has a particular effect. And so when you read it in dialogue, in a script or in a book where they have it, you go, why are you using their name? You wouldn't use that person's name in real life and things like that I think are, are important or or if you're telling you know doing too much telling and explaining and that on the nose writing which you can just hear um I think the arches is a really sometimes and, and I, I have no idea who writes the arches I don't know any names of writers or anything so I, I you know I'm not going to put my foot in it but there are times where I just can hear the difference from week to week in, and sometimes I just go, oh, my God, that episode was so brilliantly written. Um, and it's really um, it's really fascinating, actually. It is. And people have it over. in ear. That's it. Can, things can be overwritten. Yes. You can be much more economical in a way, can't you? You know, and I think it's allowing the actor to to then create more dimension. I mean, I think that is so interesting. And that's what um, I love about your dialogue and your the different characters that you've created uh, your Gavin and Stacey Stella they ju- that, I suppose that's why they feel so well formed if you haven't because obviously you didn't write all the, the Stella episodes but are, do you still have yeah. quite a strong hand on those episodes in terms of input yes and I probably was really annoying actually because <laughs> I didn't used to stick my big oar in and um and I think I probably annoyed <laughs> a few of the writers and I apologize to them now because it must must have been a bit frustrating for them but it's just that sometimes I I would I would I think oh no but they wouldn't say that they yeah. wouldn't say that but then by the same token the other writers would come up with such some brilliant ideas that I would go oh I'd never have thought of that 
or some really funny lines. And I go, oh, that's so funny. Um, but yeah, I think because I, I suppose I was the showrunner for it really as well. So I did have a uh, there was only there was one series that I tried to stand back, which was series four. Um, I didn't get I tried not to get as involved in that one, but it, it's I, I just couldn't help it. <laughs> Well, it must have been difficult not to be involved when you're in it. It's not as if you can just like go on holiday for a couple of months and come back and see what they've done yeah. because yeah. because you're bang in the middle of it, aren't you? Yes, yes, that's true. Actually, that is true. Um, and I think and when I you, loved it. Well, I and mean, when you've conceived something as well, which you did, you created. I think it, it, it again. You it, you've got, got this umbrella. Um, I view, yes. haven't you, over it? It's slightly different, yeah. I think. I can and, understand and I was, that. I was really fortunate to be able to go to the the in post-production. So I was able to, with Stella and with Gavin and Stacey, actually, but with Stella, I was able to go to the edit and the um, the sound dub. So that was great. I, I loved the post-production. I absolutely loved it because it was like, you know, you planted this little you've had a seed and you've planted this little plant and you've just watched it grow and blossom and it's just lovely to see the whole process through from the very beginning to the end and uh, and I just loved it loved it do you miss your characters when you stop writing them I do I mean Stella I I, I haven't occasionally I'll 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 have a little binge on on Stella. I've done it maybe twice, and I've watched the whole thing through. And um, and I just think, oh, she was great. She was she was because that was more comedy drama than sort of out and out comedy. Although I don't think Gavin and Stacey is out and out comedy because that no. does have some drama in it. But um, I think because Nessa is a perhaps a more striking character than Stella. Um. Nessa it still kind of lives on and I mean I and, and also during Covid I did I actually put the whole gear on uh, well because you know I was like stuck at home bored but I I um I put the whole Nessa gear on and I I filmed in this room actually I filmed um one of those messages of uh, a social distancing message and it was all um uh just because you don't feel ill don't mean you're not infected you could be riddled and it was like so it, and if you sees me, if you if you sees me doing my daily five k around Barry, don't be thinking of breaking that five meter that two meter rule. <laughs> and it's like because I will not hesitate in telling you to back off. <laughs> and I and so I did that, and that was good fun. That was really good fun. So, I think uh, yeah, Nessa, I miss them. Nessa is one of the best characters of all time. Yeah. I just think she is wonderful. It's such a brilliant creation. I mean, I know you oh, wrote the series, you. but do, do, do you feel that she's a bit like your alter ego? I mean, was she just like then? You were just brilliant. Does she just rise up like a phoenix? Does she just sort of come yeah, out? she she's does. There? She absolutely <laughs> does. And what's great about her is that she doesn't care about mm. annoying people or or telling people what she, think, what they, what she thinks. So she will do things that I would never in a million years have the courage to do. Mm. And so I did um, a charity event about, I think it was in 2018, and it was for the uh, RNLI. And I basically hosted this whole evening as Nessa. And um, it was a black tie event. There was, you know, 200 odd people there, sit down dinner. Um, and we had like only only men allowed singing. We had Bonnie Tyler. It was a great, really wow. great evening. Um, and Rob Brydon made a surprise uh, entry uh, and sang Islands in the Stream with me. Oh. It was great fun. Um, but, you know, people started to get a bit rowdy towards the end of the night and we had this auction coming up. And um, I, you know, if, if I'd been as me, I couldn't have quietened people down. But it was great because as Nestor, I can just go, Oh! I'm not standing up here for the benefit of my health. Now shut it. You know, and it, <laughs> yes. yeah. it's yeah. be so rude. And it's the same thing when yeah. we were filming, when we did um, uh, the Christmas special, we were filming in the arcade and, and it, people were, were lovely. I mean, they people came from all over the country to come and watch filming. and But it did mean there was quite a lot of noise outside. And so I did have to go out in character and just sort of say, now look, I'm very happy to meet you afterwards, but you've got to shut up, all right? You're making too much noise. We're trying to make a film in there. 
and um and it was great people were like oh yeah yeah okay um so so yeah it was it's 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 quite good it's quite um liberating actually yeah yeah <laughs> it's can, it's it's imagine. brilliant I mean, it's it's brilliant because I, I read that, you know, for that last Christmas special, it was 18 million viewings for that. Yes. Do you ever yeah. do you ever have to pinch yourself? I mean, you have you're been so successful and quite rightly so. But do you ever have to pinch yourself and think, oh, blimey, how did I get here? How's this happened? Or are you, <laughs> are you beyond all that now? It's, it, I, it's just that I don't because I haven't really like I haven't really done anything in the last few years acting wise because the Christmas special was probably the last thing I did actually on TV I haven't I haven't done any TV I've been writing my novels mm. um and and it's funny because when I read the novel in my novels when I read the um you know they do a little bump at the at the back and say Ruth Jones is best known for playing well you know do all this <laughs> kind of thing when I look at my other credits they're all like from 10 years ago or something like you know when I did Tess of the Durbervilles or Little Dorrit or something but I haven't really done anything since so I just feel a little bit of a fraud because I just think oh my god well you know I know obviously Stella but Stella finished in 2016 2017 something like that so I I, I just think I, I don't know I don't feel I, I I'm very aware of Gavin and Stacey as a, as a success. It's, just, it's been huge and it's just brilliant. And Stella, I'm really, really chuffed about it. And my novels, I'm really chuffed. But I suppose I, I take it all... I'm... I'm Partly, I, I think I do get a little bit of the old imposter syndrome, if I'm honest. And I do just go, really? Oh, I don't think I'm... I don't think I'm that good. <laughs> so I don't know, but it's... It, it's And I'm not being fake. I'm not doing a... No, um, no, no. I, do, I just no, think it's interesting. Sure. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you do, you can t- you wake up one morning and think, oh, gosh, you know, I, I've this huge body of work. And it is a huge body of work. I mean, it's it's just fantastic. Mm-hmm. Because am I right in thinking that before you did Gavin and Stacey, you hadn't written before? Is that right? Um, I did. I did write, actually. I wrote... Um, because so Kay Meller, we did. So James and I met on a series called Fat Friends, mm. which was oh, of on course. ITV yeah. in two thousand. I think we we met. Um, and Kay Meller, God rest her soul, was a, very encouraging of new writers. And I remember by about series, I, I think in between series one and two, there was a quite a big gap, and I started writing trying to write tv scripts then just sort of you know my doing my own thing i wrote something that it wasn't terribly good but i sent it to her and she gave me some really positive feedback and um I, and then i um i wrote uh i think I, I i think i offered up an episode for series uh four i think it was of fat friends and it got commissioned so i did do an episode of fat friends that was the first thing <sighs> oh, that i did okay. and then k went on to write a series called The Chase, but not The Chase that everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was about a veterinary practice. And um, and I wrote an episode of that. Um, and it was quite funny, actually, because I can't remember who the actor was, but I met somebody years later who was in The Chase. And I said, uh, I said, oh, I said, you were in The Chase, weren't you? And he said, yes, yes. I said, oh, that was, it was a great series, that. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, but some of the storylines, oh, my God. He said, one time we had a storyline where somebody brought in a snake that um, that, that was constipated. And I went, yeah, I wrote that episode. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, so those, I did write, I was commissioned to two two proper scripts. And then I'd written something on, off my own bat that never came to anything before that. So, uh, so, but Gavin and Stacey was the main main mm. thing, really. Mm. Um, I we do want to talk about the novels because, mm. and you've mentioned them. Shall we? But we need to do a mm. shout out to your mate Liz, Sonny. Oh yes, my lovely mate Liz Stone, who is the co- the reason that Ruth, you are sitting with us today, because dear <laughs> dear Liz yes. was coming to your uh, book signing, wasn't she? In Abergavenny, I think uh, it was, if for Love Untold, yes. which was your last book, and she said to me, and I said, oh Ruth, I said, I'd love her to come on the podcast. I don't know how I can get to contact her and you know what have you and she said well she said because you sound very light Liz actually she said oh well I'll ask her I said we, said, we, we can't do that she said well why not she can only say no so bless her heart so I just want to say thank you Liz Stone who's one of my oldest friends for being very very Uh-oh. brave and taking the opportunity and thank you Ruth for Aww. responding to me I'm we are very very grateful thank so you, there we Liz. go well done <laughs> yeah no, it, and it was great. lovely to meet you in Abergavenny 
Um, uh, That was a signing for Love Untold, which is, if there's anybody listening who's not read it, Mm. bloody marvellous. I mean, all three books are marvellous, but I Mm. think that, wow. I I can't say too much about it because I don't want to give it away, but it's a brilliant piece of writing. It's so clever. Did Mm. not see the end coming. You didn't either, did you say? Did not at all. Did not at all. Oh, Oh. Oh, thank you. No. Thank you. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, for people who haven't read it, it's about four generations of women, a great grandmother, a grandmother, a mother and a daughter. And I mean, obviously, so three daughters, three mothers. Hmm. And um, it's, uh, it's set it in Wales. They're a Welsh family. And it's really about a rift that happened 30 years ago between the oldest member of the family, Grace, and her daughter, Alice, hmm. and her daughter. So it's it's whether that rift can be fixed before grace who's about to turn 90 has her her birthday and uh it was um uh, it's funny because when i wrote um uh us three mm-hmm. i was really it, it, because that spanned about four decades and i thought right I, I mustn't write something that goes over several decades for the next book i must try and keep it in the day and just you know over a couple of months or something and i just I ended up writing, I think it expanded even more. I think it was like five decades that it spanned over. But I do love, I love a good sort of family saga. I think that's what it is. That's why why I was interested in doing it. (laughs) It's really, really clever. And you, the thing is you write, Sonny and I get so pissed off with the way that older women are written. Because we're all sort of written off as being like incontinent no-hopers. And we're not... You know, we're not entirely incontinent yet. But, <laughs> but you just write, you just write, well, you write younger women brilliantly, obviously, mm. but you write older women so mm. well. And it's a very, oh. very, very rare thing. And honestly, mm. as one gets older, it's very, very nice to see people of of, of one's own age and older being represented mm. as kind of compassmentous mm. and a mm. part of society. Oh, mm. thank you. Well, I, I really wanted to do that because... Um, I mean, there were th- several things that sort of contributed to the story, but one of them was that my, I did um, Who Do You Think You Are uh, for BBC, mm. and it it followed my, uh, both my grandfathers, because I never knew either of my grandfathers. And my mother's father died when my mother was two, so she didn't know her father really at all. But his family were all from Newquay in West Wales, and um, I didn't know this. So I spent a couple of days there, and 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 actually Dylan's key in the book mm. is Newquay, really. I mean, I based oh, it on, okay. on Newquay because I felt such a connection with the whole place. Um, so that that was that. But then also my, on when I explored my other grandfather, my my father's father's side of the family. Um, there were these love letters that were written to my grandmother uh, by my grandfather, and they were just they. I, what I couldn't get over it, over them with was how they were so sort of modern, um, and they were quite not risque, but well, they were actually a little bit like you know things like um, I can't stop thinking about you lying in my arms last night, and and it just they. And calling her bit and saying, um, like, uh, like an expression like baby, sort of like a, a term of affection. Just it was all very, very modern and not how I imagined, you know, because to me, my grandmother was this little old lady who used to put several scarves around her head to sort of keep her head warm when she walked down to our house. But she was this very vibrant, alive um gl- glamorous young woman you know who was 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 got married in 1926 and had this beautiful wedding dress and i just think you know I, you're quite right we we automatically the younger generation i don't want to make generalizations but i feel and i probably did it myself that you kind of get written off by younger people because just oh you're just old mm. and and I remember talking to my niece about something um like a you know kind of a relationship thing that was going on and I said you I said I do know I do know what you're going through you know I do understand and she was oh no you oh no you don't and I'm going mm-hmm. no but I do because in my mind I'm still your age I'm still a teenager so I wanted to create a character so that the main character in the book is 
uh, you know, Grace is n- is nearly ninety. She goes, uh, she goes, uh, does yoga. She does Pilates. She still she walks everywhere. She still drives, and she goes swimming in the sea. And when I told my mother that, who's eighty seven, she went, "Oh well, that's just ridiculous. Nobody will ever believe that." <laughs> Well, we but, did. Well, we yes, did. We right. completely did. You know. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think as well with those older characters within the book as well, because they, you know, they they are, aren't they? There's a, th- three of them particularly. But the, it's a, you write with the essence. You write about the essence of the character, the soul of the character. Uh, it's it's mm-hmm. you know it, it immediately you know who you're with, and I'm inside them as as a as a reader. You know, it's not an external experience. I'm completely. Uh, inside those characters on that journey, and it's such a gift to be able to do that. Do you, was there always a novelist in you? Think, Ruth? Did you? Always... No, I, I don't think there was. I um, I I'm an I'm an accidental novelist because when I t- I told you about that period of time when I started writing um TV scripts, I wrote a, a script, but probably gosh, it was about two thousand. I think it was two thousand two, something like that. Uh, and it was a a two parter, and um, I. Nothing came of it. I think I tried to get an agent through. I sent it away. Nobody was really interested. And I forgot all about it. And then about, oh, gosh, eight years ago now, I found it again in my on my laptop. And I reread it. And although there was a lot wrong with it, the story was really good. And I just thought, as an experiment, I would try adapting it to prose fiction. And just as a labour of love, really. And I loved the process. I really, really enjoyed it. And I did about... 10,000 words and then I thought oh I wonder if this is I I couldn't tell whether it was any good or not because I couldn't be objective enough about it (laughs) so I happened to be um I was still in touch with a a friend of mine from university who was a literary agent who's a really big literary agent now Johnny Geller and he uh I, I said can I get some advice and he ended up taking me on as a client and there was like a bidding war for this this book which was I totally didn't see that one coming. I did not see that one coming. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the 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 slight issue at the time was, are people going to think my novel, my first novel, is going to be like Gavin and Stacey or Stella? And it's just going to be, is it going to be comedic? And it, um, and of course, for people who've, who've who've read Never Greener, it's it's. I mean, I probably couldn't write that novel now. It it's really quite sort of you know the, the central character is not very pleasant really and um it's quite hedonistic and uh it's a lot of sex in it and uh and which is why i couldn't do the read the, the audio book because i kept imagining my <laughs> listening to me describing this sort of graphic sex so um yeah so uh but but people were it, it was it was well received and and went to number one in the Sunday Times Ooh, charts. Really? I was very 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 chuffed about. Uh, but thankfully, I think generally people didn't expect as I thought they might. They didn't expect it to be like Gavin and Stacey. So that was good. Mm. That was yeah. good because uh, sorry, Jenny. the central character it's Kate, isn't it? And yes, and, yeah. Yes. I mean, she's not a nice person, but I still <laughs> wanted to read about her. So yeah, yeah, you know, I'm still turning the pages, going, "What is she going to do next?" Mm. And yeah. um, in us three, Lana's not not always particularly nice, is she? But again, it's like, well, I want to know more. I want to know what mm. she's going to do next because they're they're you still get the soul of them somehow, even though they're baddies. Yeah, so again, it, yes, yeah. I mean, going I, yeah, going back to Ambridge, it's a bit like George Grundy, isn't it? I mean, he's a baddie, mm. but I kind of want to know what he's doing yes. next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yes. and it's the same. You very cleverly write these characters that um, that, that are so engaging, even though they're not, mm. even though they're not the goodies. Yeah, that was yeah. wonderful. Alice, books. Alice is a bit like that, isn't she? In the in Love Untold, mm. you know, yeah, she's yeah. not. And mm. all three of those characters, I think, are the. I actually think they're really interesting characters, and they're they're all um, they've all got issues with alcohol. All three of them. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, um, made them really interesting. And they, and it's funny because they, um, with certainly with Kate and with Lana, they're both actresses. And so people then are going, "Oh, is it based on you?" And I, <laughs> oh, for God, oh no, it's not based on me. But obviously, I know about that world of uh, TV filming, and and <laughs> and one of the things I, I really did enjoy doing in Never Greener was writing the awards 
night, the award ceremony, yeah. <laughs> with uh, people being on on coke and just yes. repeating themselves and gurning and and uh, that kind of thing. So yeah, there was there was there was a, a lot of life experience in there yeah. you know, that I picked up on the way. Yeah, they it, they really are. You know, yeah, a big terrific, boring, but, but it's a very different them. experience. Oh, they are, yeah, fabulous. But it's a different experience, isn't it? Bit writing a solitary, you know, and a novel the, from doing the scripts for Stella and uh, Gavin and Stacey. I mean, was it a very different technique that you applied, or did you just enter that world effortlessly? Um, yeah, I think it is. It is solitary. That's the 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 thing about it. The the big difference. But but also you get a lot more freedom with a novel because mm. obviously you don't have the restrictions of uh, locations, actor availability, time slots on screen. Um, so you know, apart from you know, you, you can't really write sort of two hundred thousand words. You've got a rough, roughly between eighty and a hundred thousand words. But that's pretty much it. So um, and and it was a lovely process and certainly the f the first novel I went to, to a place in Bungay where they uh, where in Suffolk where they um, print the books and I said oh I'd really like to go and see the book you know the final thing being done and uh, I went there and I was expecting it to be like you know a little man uh, with a pile of books sort of putting a cover on it and it was this huge factory process with all these books going along this conveyor belt and the covers being put on them and and it, i took one out um and i just wrote in it i said this is the first book of mine that i have held in my hands uh, and uh and it's so exciting to 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 have this experience and then i put it back into the 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 whole process Somebody somewhere has got that novel. <laughs> It'll be worth a fortune. My goodness gracious, how fantastic. That's so lovely. Yeah, it was a lovely, it was a really lovely thing to do. And of course, you know, it'll never be experienced again because mm. that was my first one and, and that was that. But um, no, it was lovely. And I love the world of publishing. I've, I've, I've worked with a really lovely team in in, um, in Transworld is the, the, the my publisher and they're part of Pen Penguin Random House. And um and and it's been a joy to work with them on on all the novels so far. So, yes, onwards. And, and is there another four. one? Is there another novel yes. now? In number four at the moment. Number four is um, I've written the first draft, uh, <gasps> and I'm just working on the on the notes. So and it's di it's different. Um, but another kind of like um, uh, well I won't say no I won't say too much but I think. Mm. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I'm enjoying it because it's it's slightly different stylistically, so it's uh, that's made it quite nice. Now with another, uh, you know, Ruth Jones hat on. You're going into the West End. You're opening in the West End, aren't you? Yeah. In March. I know. How in sister is that? Act. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. So we we're doing. I mean, I, I literally that did not. I was that was not part of the plan. I didn't. Well, I didn't. I don't really have a plan. That's the thing. Um, and this, I was offered. An email came in and said, "Would you would you consider the part of Mother Superior in Sister Act?" And I was like, "I'm not I'm not a Mother Superior. Why Why are they thinking? I actually thought have they made a mistake?" <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was various sort of toing and froing, and um, met with the the producer, and uh, I really wasn't sure, but they. They were very keen for me to do it. And um, I think it will be different, maybe a different version. I think the good thing about the character of Mother Superior is that she's open to sort of interpretation. So yeah. Jennifer Saunders has played her and um, uh, Sheila Hancock obviously played her in, in, in the first uh, West End run. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited, really excited to do it. But I've never been in a, a I've been, I was in musicals in school, but I've never done a professional musical and uh, and I've never been in the West End before, so um, it's it's and I'm I'm really chuffed that at fifty seven I'm going to be a West End Wendy. I can't wait. <laughs> Fantastic! Yeah, Fantastic! Are you rehearsing at the minute? Please do come and see it. Oh, we'd it's, love it's to. Be... Oh, we'd, we'd love we'll to. We'd love to. So, are you rehearsing at the minute, then, Ruth? Or uh, no? Um, so I'm I'm going to Dublin with a tour. So there's a tour going on, and then there'll be the London production. So okay. I'm doing a bit of both. So I'm doing um uh, I'm going to Dublin in February. I think February the thirteenth. Uh, I think we're there for two weeks, and then I come back and rehearse for the London, the London uh, version. So, right. uh, so yeah. So I've been 
having a few singing lessons and learning my lines um that's that's the thing i that's my thing is is uh, is remembering lines on stage because i mm. i haven't done theatre for that precise reason in recent years because i just uh i mean i don't know how you feel about but, but to the thought of doing I did a play in 2018 and I remember at the time thinking I must never accept a theatre job again because mm. it's just too stressful trying to remember lines. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's worse things in, in life. It is tough. It is tough. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I completely uh, understand where you're coming from. And many, many years ago, I did Shirley Valentine many, many years ago. Oh, and I you? terrified myself yeah. so much because, you know, you're on stage two and a half hours on your own, blinking, you know, one person monologue. Yeah. And it is, it's really... I, I I get you, but you'll be fabulous. You will be fabulous. But I do understand. Oh. I do understand where you're coming yes. from with it. I do. Yes. Um, yeah. It's but yeah, March, continue. isn't it? March the fifteenth. March the fifteenth. Is that right? Uh, yeah, or the eighteenth. I think it's the eighteenth. Right. I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's and, and with, with Beverly Knight, who <gasps> is her voice is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it's just amazing her voice. So uh, oh. I can't because we we did a thing for the Royal Variety Show. We did a did, we did um, raise your voice, which is one of the songs. Mm -hmm. um, we did that for uh, the Royal Variety Show. I wasn't in this. I didn't perform the song, but I did a little sort of sketch beforehand with Bradley Walsh, and mm -hmm. um, so uh, and it was and, and I loved that because it got me to dive in at the deep end. With I got to meet some of the cast and and just be in the Albert Hall on mm. stage. I, I'm not. That doesn't, it doesn't frighten me being on stage. It's just because I do book events with quite a lot of people in the audience and that doesn't bother me because I, I, it's not a script then. It's just, you know, talking, but um, it's, it's just, yeah, but I'm going to, I'm going to think positively. I'm going to think positively. I will remember them all. <laughs> oh, you, 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 you will be fine. I mean, it's just the actor's nightmare, isn't it? Really? We, we sort of terrify yeah. ourselves, but it's always yes. fine. It's always fine. <laughs> it's just, yes. Uh, yes. you know. Yes. <laughs> and the adrenaline, the adrenaline sort of, you know, pushes you through and, you know, I hope the habit is comfortable. Yeah. I hope that habit is comfortable, Ruth. It's, it is. The, I think that the box bit on my head might need a little adjusting. That's the, that's the bit that, that kind of clings to your head a little bit. But uh, the rest of it is quite nice, actually. It covers a multitude of sins and, <laughs> uh, you know, I can, I can hide all sorts up there really for, you know, Tin of biscuits. Uh, yeah, for half time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So, one of the questions that we ask our guests is because um, we're getting towards the end of, of this podcast, and bless your heart for doing this with us. Is there anything, or what would you say to your younger self if you could? Well, do you know it's it's probably I I, I was think I was. I often think about this because I can look back at my life and I just go, oh, Ruth, why did you not realise what you had then? And, you know, it's like when you look at photographs of yourself when you're younger. And I look at, this is what breaks my heart with teenage girls mm -hmm. particularly, where they think that they look awful. And, you know, I, and I can remember, I just thought, oh, God, I'm oh I'm so fat. I used to have this whole thing. Well, in fact, I wasn't skinny, but I wasn't fat. But you know, I look at photos of myself. And I just think, oh, you were gorgeous. Why did you not realise? Why were you so down on yourself? And I wish that we all could appreciate ourselves really more. And so I think it, there's that, and there's also the confidence. Um, what you know, I I I would say to my younger self now, um you you are you've got it all there you've got it all there be believe in yourself believe in yourself honestly you really have got a lot going for yourself just keep just keep believing because i i so i was so down on myself when i was younger i really was and what a waste of time because before you know it you know you're 57 and you're looking back and going oh why didn't i make make realize what i what yeah potential I had I think that that that's the thing really um and also I always say you today is the youngest I'm ever going to be this is the youngest I'm ever going to be so enjoy it make them because you can look back now at a photo of, say 10 years ago oh gosh 
Yeah. <laughs> where did those 10 years go? Yeah. So I, I have reached a point in life now where I'm going to, uh, where I, I do try to, uh, it sounds a little bit twee, but I do try to enjoy and make the most of each day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, with this challenge with Sister Act, for example, yeah. I'm going to enjoy that challenge. So, yeah. um, sorry, I've really answered you in a very long-winded way and you probably wanted something very no. precise. No. I would say to my younger <laughs> self, believe in yourself. Yeah. Believe in yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I would hope that I would listen. So, <laughs> so, so, it's advice. so right. Wise words. No, it is wise words. And, and it is about seizing the day, isn't it? You know, and just sort of going for it. But, yes, yeah. we're so down on ourselves when we're younger, aren't we, actually? And, and it's... Um, yes. I think we yeah, all do it. I yeah, look back at yeah. photographs. I think, oh, yeah. I think, what's wrong with you? You want absolutely fine, you know. But we, we <laughs> yeah. you know, there, yes. there we are. Um, but I can't tell you how thrilling this has been to actually speak mm. to you. It really, really has because uh, we both admire you so much. Um, uh, you know, as as a performer, as a writer, but actually as a human being, I just think you are so delightful and so you oh, still oh, and that you know you've had such huge success you 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 could be very different you're just delightful so bless you for coming well, back you. to well, me I, when... I, oh I've really enjoyed it it's been it's been lovely it's been it's been just like hanging out with a couple of oh, friends good. and having oh, a little thank you. Friday night so oh. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed myself and it's been lovely oh. to meet you but Really Lovely nice. to meet you. And we will try and get to see Sister Act. And, you know, we will definitely and, see you know, Sister and I'll Act. I'll email you to that. Not that you necessarily have to come yeah. and say hello to us, but to tell you that we're no, really. Please do. Okay. You must come and say hello. You must come and see me <laughs> play close up in my habit. <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll pinch your biscuits. That's right. Yes. And you can show us, you know, yes, what, 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 what draws these habits. I mean, I, mean, I don't know what do, what do nuns wear beneath their habits. Or should we not go into that? Is that oh, for another podcast? I, oh, I don't. <laughs> Mm, that is for yes that's that's very interesting i could tell you but i would be giving away state trade secrets, secrets. Oh, trade okay. secrets we don't want that we don't want that but look <laughs> thank you you've had a really busy day thank you so much ruth for for, yeah. for joining us today it's been great and just to reiterate you're going to be at the dominion theater as the reverend mother in sister act uh, from march to i think it's the 8th of june i think there may be the old little performance that you're not doing is that yes. right so people need to go to the yes, website I'm and not, just check all I'm that out i'm not doing it yeah, I'm not doing it the 9th to the 13th because my stepdaughter is having her delayed wedding, which she was oh. meant to have in COVID, and they've had two children since then. So <laughs> so we're going to France for for, for that. So, um, yeah, yeah. But um, so. please do come and see it, everyone. It's, it's a really great show. It's a really uplifting mm. show. So yeah. just to come yeah, and yeah, see yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you again for asking me onto our lovely podcast. Thank not you so much all. for coming, Take Ruth. care. Thank Lots you. of love, Ruth. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to our One Stiletto in the Grave podcast. If you'd like to see behind the scenes clips and bonus content, please visit our Facebook page, One Stiletto in the Grave podcast. And if you'd like to ask any questions, follow us on Twitter at One Stiletto 65. This podcast is produced by Raggedy House Productions and the music composed by Tom Smith. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>